Welcome to the This Is Horror Podcast. This is a very special Friday edition of the podcast. And today, we will be interviewing Nathan Ballingrude in part two of our interview. Now, before we interview him, I just wanted to let everyone know that if you pre-order The Visible Filth this weekend you can still take advantage of our pre-order bonuses. Now, The Visible Filth will be shipping finally at the end of this month. So, everyone who has pre-ordered, you will be getting your copy of The Visible Filth either at the end of this month or the start of April. Now, in case you're not aware, here are the pre-order bonuses that you will get to enjoy. You will receive a free unabridged audiobook written and narrated by Nathan Ballingrude in its entirety. You will receive a special signature sheet so that your copy of The Visible Filth will be signed by Nathan Ballingrude. And you will receive free ebook versions of The Visible Filth in Mobi, EPUB and PDF format. Now you will get both the free audiobook and the free ebooks before the physical edition of The Visible Filth is available. In fact, you will receive these bonuses this weekend. So that is Saturday the 21st and Sunday the 22nd of March. Now you have until the end of this weekend to pre-order the visible filth and to receive those bonuses. And if that isn't enough to whet your appetite, then after the interview we will be previewing a little sample from the audiobook. So with that said, let's jump in to part two of our very special interview with Nathan Ballingrude. And now for our horror interview. Now, as we're releasing the visible filth imminently, why should our readers read The Visible Filth? And what is it that you would say sets it apart from your other stories? Um, well, I don't really know if I can answer the first part of that question. Uh, I'm, I could talk about the second part, though. The, uh, it's, it's set apart, I think, from the stories that came before in that I think it's more of a more strictly a classical horror story than some of the other stories are. Um, I think it's uh, it plays with some of the uh, tropes of horror fiction and even horror cinema a little bit, uh, and more so than I've done maybe in the past. And uh, I think it's a darker and, and, and maybe a grittier story, meaner story than I than I've written. Um, you know, I was like I say, I was. I was a little bit bothered by having written the end. I, think, I felt maybe it was too much. Uh, there was a, one of the early reviews came back and saying, if you don't gag when you read the story, then, then, you know, you're a stronger man than I. And that, you know, that kind of took me back. I was like, oh, am I a guy who writes that kind of story now? And, uh, and I guess apparently, yes, yes, I am. Um, I don't know <laughs> that I'll write many more in this, in this, uh, in this vein, but it was fun to do. And I'm glad that I did it. And I'm, um, you know, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about it right now. So, I'm, I'm not really, uh, I don't, I'm, I'm not really good at you know talking about why people should read my fiction. So, I, that probably does a poor job of answering your question. But, uh, well, but uh, I think it was an interesting project, and uh, I'm glad that I did it, and I feel pretty good about the final result. Well, to add some context to that quote, that was from Rob Olson, who is the co-presenter of the Booked podcast. Um, yes. So I I don't know if you've listened to the review episode in the in its entirety, but I certainly do feel that they got the story and it you know didn't just think oh this is 
a gross out or a, <laughs> a story oh, yeah. that's trying to make you gag. I, I I think they certainly understood how it worked on numerous levels. They did. I did listen to it, and they certainly did. And I was I was I was thrilled with the with their reaction to it. It was very satisfying as a writer to 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 be understood in that way. It was it was that line that that that, that jumped out at me because it was it was so alien to the way that I perceive myself as a writer, and uh, and of course how we perceive ourselves as writers often has little to do with how we're perceived by by readers. So that doesn't make any difference at all. But uh, but I remember it was just kind of a it was a it was a surprise. No, I mean, it, you know, it, it was the ending to the story, you know, as I've said before, it kind of took your breath away. It was, you know, it was something that was very visceral and it delivered a particular emotional punch. I think if people are listening to this and thinking, you know, that the ending was, was a gross out or whatever, absolutely not. And if you've read any of Nathan's fiction previously, you know, it it holds all of the values, you know, the the fantastic you know, descriptive and lyrical pra- uh, prose, but I would say that, yeah, in terms of, it's, it's certainly a level abund- above in terms of, you know, it is a, a bit more aggressive maybe than some of your other stories. It's a, you know, it, it is more of a, a quote unquote horror story than others. And yeah, it will, it is a, it is a gut punch, the end in it, you know, it wrenches at your, at your insides, but certainly not in a, not in a disgusting way, not in an unsavory way, in the way that for me every horror sh- horror story should, you know, to leave you thinking about it long after you've finished reading it. And you know, I think that that quote shouldn't be taken out of context, as Michael says. And you know, it's it's something that should be used as an endorsement from my point of view, anyway. Was that just a rambling load of bollocks from me? <laughs> <laughs> no, I... no, I support what you just said. <laughs> Okay, good. <laughs> there was just a just a silence at the end of the line. I wasn't quite sure uh, <laughs> if I'd made myself clear or not. <laughs> so Nathan, are there any stories that you have had a physical reaction to? Uh, <clears throat> yeah. Um, when I was younger, uh, I, when I started reading Clive Barker's Books of Blood, I definitely had a physical reaction to those. Um, and it was that it was the it was the combination of being uh, kind of physically repulsed at some of the depictions of the violence that he was or in the stories, but it was also this this excited fascination and this the sort of the sort of the sense of discovering something vital and kinetic and uh, and and and, uh, and, and and well exciting that uh, that I hadn't encountered before and uh, and Barker was. I think for a lot of writers of my generation, it was just a flashpoint, uh, just invigorating in a way that uh, the other writers weren't. And uh, and so in, in those stories, yes. And also, uh, oh, there's that what's that Chuck Palahniuk story uh, about the poor kid in the pool? That was uh, probably this. Uh, I think it's called Guts. It that is. Was probably the only it story. is. Yeah, Guts. Guts. Yeah, that's the one. That was the only story that I really had a difficult time finishing because I was feeling physically ill, and uh, <clears throat> I'm not sure that was a recommendation or not. It's uh, <laughs> it certainly did its job, but uh, I would not choose to read it again. Oh yeah, I mean guts is infamous now for people actually passing out at live readings of it as well. <laughs> yeah, I, I that, doesn't, that doesn't surprise me. I was. I was reading it at a slow day at work, and I, <laughs> I, I did feel physically queasy at some points, and uh, yeah, uh, it's I don't know. I, a story like that seems to be it's a, an exercise in effect, and if that's the case, you know, it, it was a success. But I don't know what other qualities that I, it had that I would recommend it. Maybe that's because I haven't read it in a couple of years, and there's more to it. But but uh, I left. Physically impressed, but not not impressed in any other way. And I don't want to do the stories like that at all. Well, when it came up in conversation with Stephen Graham Jones, mm-hmm. he, he theorized that the reason that so many people passed out was because in the beginning, the story says this, this should last about as long as you can hold your breath. 
<laughs> so there are people trying to hold their breath, and then obviously it, it went on a little bit too long. <laughs> you might just be onto something. Yeah. Do you... you ever write outside the horror and dark fiction genre? I know that you've said before that you've got a real love for and fascination with spy fiction. Yeah, I do. Although I don't, I don't write it. Uh, everything I, everything that I've done so far, and all the ideas that are still in my head, seem to be pretty comfortably either horror or dark fantasy, or you know, wherever on that spectrum, you know, people want to put it. Um, I have been uh, contracted to write a uh, a story for a, uh, an unofficial James Bond anthology coming out from CZP later this year. So that'll be my first foray into uh, into spy fiction. That should be fun. But that's not my that's not my natural inclination, so it probably will just be a one off. But uh, no, my 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 home is my home is dark fantasy and horror fiction. It's my uh, it's, it's just where I'm more, most comfortable, and it's where my imagination just leads me. I think even when I try not to do it, it ends up going down that road. So I don't foresee it changing anytime soon, if ever. And so you've got another collection on the horizon as well i read a couple of the stories that you sent my way the atlas of hell being a particular standout and what a great <laughs> title <laughs> yeah that's that was fun that was a that was a story that was much the stories coming out are much different from the ones that were in the book uh, at least in my mind you know the atlas of hell is about has no greater ambition than just to be a kind of a driving narrative about people doing getting caught up in a, in a bad situation in the swamps of Louisiana. Um, it's not an emotionally resonant story, really. It's just, it's almost like just an action story. And I had never done anything like that before. It was fun to do. And that is the first story, what will be a sequence of stories about that character in that evolving situation. So I hope one day to be able to put those together in a book by themselves. And with the, the other stories, which will be presumably in this collection is a, uh, I, uh, I try. I try to do the same kind of sort of thing, in that each one was an experiment in a different direction. Whereas the first book, there's a lot of unity and theme, and the second one, I think that's going to be a lot of more uh, diversity and theme. It's going to be a little more wide ranging in styles and and intentions. Are we going to see a return to kind of you know classic horror monsters? You know, you've got a although they are atypical, you have still got a a werewolf and a vampire story in your in your first collection. Are we going to see any any typical you know Nathan takes on uh, on old tropes again? Well, I don't think in that sense, um, and maybe in a different sense. I've got the story in there about a ghoul society, um, uh, uh, about these kids, these 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 child ghouls who escape their confines and go raid a uh, a fair uh, in the early part of the twentieth century. And uh, so that's also very different. There's a story in there about a uh, called the Diabolist, about a uh, about a satanic uh, practitioner who dies, and his daughter discovers his laboratory uh, after he has passed away, and then uh, the thing that he's trapped down there. Um, I'm writing a, a club story, you know, in the sense of the old Dunsany tales about uh, this group of old Satanists who meet and and tell each other stories of their exploits. And uh, and so maybe tropes in that sense, but not so much in the uh, in the vampire, werewolf, uh, zombie sense. Cool. And they tend not to be they... quite as the visible filth being an exception. They tend not to be quite as uh, uh, ponderous or serious as some of the stories in North America, like monsters. Yeah, there's quite a few uh, few heavy themes in that book. So yeah. Not that that's to its detriment at all, as we've said. We absolutely love that book, so it'll be interesting to see what you know what the next one's like. Have you got any any details on dates and you know things no, like that for the next one? No, it's it's too early for all that. It's it's uh, it's submitted, and uh, and some of the stories still have to be written. Uh, all the, they haven't all been finished yet, so it's still that's still very much in the in the uh, nebulous stage. Okay, cool. And I guess from what you were saying about your write, your writing routine earlier, that rather than 
saying, okay, I'm going to write in the morning or I'm going to write in the evening. It is literally about just snatching whatever moment in the day or in the week presents itself to you. Yes, exactly. It's, it's, it'd be difficult to carve out a routine uh, the way things are right now. So you just, you grab time when it's available. Sometimes that's early in the morning. Sometimes it's late at night. And on my days off, I might steal some time in the afternoon and go out and have some coffee somewhere and bring the laptop and be, you know, be one of those guys who's in the corner mm-hmm. right away. But, you know, <laughs> wherever, wherever the time presents itself, you snatch it. And so do you think it's this routine that almost lends itself to meaning that once the first draft is complete, the final one is because you have to kind of revisit and reread before starting for that day anyway, because it could have been numerous days previous that you last wrote. Um, it's possible, although I don't usually do a lot of rereading when I sit down to write. Uh... I'll just usually just I'll, I might look at the at the last paragraph that I wrote, and just go from there. I don't usually spend time uh, rereading what I've done because then I it, it, I'll depress myself. You know, I'll find all the things that I hate about it, and then I'll I'll start worrying about that, and I won't make any progress. So usually that in draft revision comes as I'm actually writing it. You know, uh, which which may be why I only get 300 words done a day because those 300 words will take me a couple of hours. But, um, yeah, I don't like to go back too much until I finish the, the entire first draft, and then I'll go back and read. But if I do it in the middle of the draft, I just get bogged down. And how many first readers do you send it out to? I know that you mentioned sending it to beta readers beforehand for them to identify where you could make changes. Uh, usually just one. Uh, I'll send it to my friend Dale. Uh, Dale Bailey, who's also a, a terrific writer, but um, sometimes there'll be others who want to read it, but uh, but the other ones will sort of present themselves or not. Uh, Dale's the only constant, but his aesthetic and mine are very very similar, and he, he and I have been friends since uh, man since nineteen ninety one or two, uh, so he probably. I think we we uh, we respond to each other's fiction in a way that other people. In a very fundamental way that other people couldn't be expected to. We've been reading it and critiquing each other for for a long time now. So I trust his uh, I trust the judgment implicitly. And did you meet one another through your fiction, through your passion for writing? We did. We were students in the Clarion Writers Workshop together. Ah, okay. And uh, yeah, with I was there with uh, with Dale Bailey. Uh, Corey Doctorow, Jeff Vandermeer, and it was a it was a good class. Uh, yeah, he he and I have been friends, good friends since uh, since that time. Wow, that certainly is a good class. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you've um you've since taught one of your own, haven't you, Nathan? Weren't you uh, involved in one of the online Lit Reactor courses? Yes, uh, I said not. I had not taught Clarion, but uh, I was I taught a Lit Reactor course with. Uh, let's see, it was uh, Dale was another one of the teachers, Helen Marshall and Gemma Files. And for the past few years, I've, <clears throat> excuse me, the past few years I've been doing uh, Shared Worlds. It's a teen writers workshop that uh, that Jeff Vandermeer is involved with. Uh, that takes place a few miles south of me in Spartanburg, South Carolina. And it's two weeks, and teens from all over the world will kind of congregate there, and they will collaborate on inventing a secondary world, complete with its own rules, uh, its religion, its economy, its political system, its uh, folklore. And then they will each write individual short stories that take place in that world. And while they're there, they'll receive critiques from uh, writers like me or from uh, like Tobias Bakel or uh, I think Nettie Akorafor is coming soon. Um, and uh, and they'll be they'll be recipients of seminars from from people. You know, Will he- Will Heinmarch does a seminar about making maps and how maps affect the culture of a place, uh, as an example. And uh, it's a it's a phenomenal experience. My own daughter goes, and she loves it. Now, I encourage anybody. Really cool, but, yeah, I wish it was around when I was when I was a teenager. And if anyone listening has a teen who's at all interested in in, in writing or fantasy, definitely check out Shared Worlds. It's a it's it's an amazing thing. 
what do you do in terms of your own personal development as a writer? Do you attend seminars or are there particular non-fiction books that you dip in and out of? Uh, no, not really. I don't attend seminars uh, because there's not much opportunity or time for me to do that. Uh, Warren Wilson College is fairly close by, so I guess I could that if I wanted to, but it's just not a thing that occurs to me to do. And I don't read books about writing very much. Um, I'm sure I could stand to. I'm sure there are things I could pick up. It's just writing time is, or reading time rather, is uh, it's pretty precious to me. And so I'll, I'll read fiction. I read widely. Uh, I read, I, by far, the, the bulk of my reading is not within the genre. Uh, I think it's important to kind of, uh, as we were saying earlier, to, to, to keep fresh fresh out, outlooks, fresh material coming into your brain at all times. And, uh, and I, that's, where, that's where my study comes from. It comes from other fiction writers. And what's the best book that you read last year? Oh, man. The best book I read last year. That's a hard one. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, I read so... I read, oh, man, I read so many. Uh, there's a book called... Uh, the Land Breakers by John Ely, who's, uh, who's actually a, a, a local writer, an Appalachian, local to me anyway, uh, who writes about the history of Appalachian development. And this, The Land Breakers is about the first settlers in the, uh, in the mountains here and them just trying to build a, build a home for themselves. And it was, it's breathtakingly beautiful. Uh, uh, just a gorgeous, gorgeous book. Uh, I recommend it very highly. I recommend, I recommend, uh, Oh man, this question shouldn't shouldn't bring me up short like it like it does, but it but it did. Uh, a book <laughs> called uh, "All That Is" by James Salter, a uh, beautiful novel. An old man who, or just about the, an older man who's looking back on his life and just reflecting. It sounds dishwater dull when I say it that way, but I assure you, it's the farthest thing from dull. It's a beautiful book. Um, Helen Marshall's short story, short story collection. Mm. Uh, Let's see, Gifts of the One Who Comes After. I think Helen is one of the most exciting new writers coming down the pike, and I will gratefully read whatever I can find by her. Those are the ones that stand out to me right away. Oh, uh, Adam Neville. Uh, Adam Neville, who I think is the, one of the, probably the best horror novelists working right now. Uh, even though it wasn't published last year, I read Last Days last year, and uh, I found that really scary and very effective. <laughs> Yeah, there were some really, really frightening parts of Last Days, I thought. The uh, the parts at the beginning in particular, which were almost found footage style chapters. Yeah. I thought they were, yeah. they were superbly done, to be honest. Really, really good. Yeah, Neville knocks me out. I think he's just, just terrific. What yeah. other um what other British writers are you are you in tune with? You know, who who on this side of the pond are you uh, are you keen to read as well as Adam? Hmm. Um, if you have any, of course, don't worry. Well, well I, 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 I know he's the only one. <laughs> no, I, I know that I do. It's just I, I probably read a couple hundred books a year, and I'm just trying to. I never. I don't group them by nationality typically, so I'm trying to think. Uh, Robert Shearman, um, like like Helen Marshall, I think the two of them write very similar kinds of fiction, and it's the sort of fiction that I could never even dream of doing. I don't know how they how they write stories the way they do, but I find it fascinating and, and very exciting. Um, oh, I read uh, Hilary Mantel for the first time last year. I read uh, oh, the book about the, uh, the fortune teller, Beyond Black. Uh, I found that to be fantastic. Cool. No, just, um, I just find it interesting that we have, you know, I feel like a lot of American writers kind of gain, uh, gaining traction in the British, you know, genre community. I'm just interested to see, you know, how that favor is returned with British writers, you know, yeah. making their way uh, across the pond. I was just wondering, you know, how it is that Stephen you, you can't find specific books. Oh yeah, yeah. Which which uh, is I read his uh, his collection last year uh, when it was up for the uh, the British Fantasy Award, and uh, it came up from Greyfire Press. Uh, Monsters in the Heart is what yeah. it's called. Yeah, that is. Yeah, it's a fantastic Another, collection. Yeah, it's just beautiful stuff. Just beautiful stuff. Uh, Linda Rucker, I believe. Is, is, I believe 
she may now she may be American born, but I think she's living either in the UK or in Ireland. Um, but she had a, a short story coming out too, or a short story collection came out that was I, I found extremely effective. Yeah, I think she's American, but as you say, is is living in Ireland, so we we, we can claim her for the for the UK. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why not? <laughs> and uh, I guess I guess if we get to claim Linda Rucker, then we can claim Helen Marshall because she's currently in Oxford. <laughs> Yeah, so. you, <laughs> that's true. And, uh, and uh, you know, this is not a writer, but uh, Swan River Press uh, is just putting out wonderful book after wonderful book. You know, I've almost got a, if they had a subscription service, then I would have that. You know, I try to get whatever they have coming down the pike. Um, that's how I discovered Mark Valentine, uh, who's, uh, who's a writer I just adore. Um, you know, Valentine writes, they're fairly small releases uh, that, if they come through Swan River or for Tartarus books, um, or even or even smaller presses, but there's these these strange, almost diamond perfect little stories that I, I just cannot get enough of. If you are a fan of Stephen Volk, did you read his novella Whitstable, which was put out by another small press, Spectral Press? Yeah, Spectral. I did. Yeah, I had to. I had to wait for it to be collected in the uh, in Stephen Jones's uh, best horror of the year, but uh, I did, and uh, I, I think it's I think it's deserves every bit of praise that it's getting. Uh, and he's got another one out, uh, Leighton Stone, right? That's uh, that's part of a kind of a thematic trilogy. Yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. The problem is that the you know the Spectral Press releases the shipping is just so much. I know you guys know all about this. Yeah. That it's prohibitive for me to to order copies of it, but. Uh, it costs like like somewhere in the neighborhood of forty dollars to order like a some of those paperbacks, which is just sometimes it's a little bit too much for me. But well, um, well, this is why we made the move to having our books available on Amazon, so that if people want to buy it internationally, then they can do that via their local Amazon site rather than paying the shipping costs that unfortunately the royal mail will charge us to <laughs> send it out to you guys um, right i'm glad you did that's yeah. uh you know I've, I've seen ray cluley is his uh water for drowning is suddenly very affordable here in the u.s because of that which is nothing but good news for us yeah and of course um to bring that right back around to the visible filth i mean that's why we included so many incentives for those who do pre-order and who do want to buy it via the site because i i think because of the shipping cost in particular um and also just to say thank you for people who are so loyal to kind of buy it on day one you want to give right. back <laughs> that was i was yeah I'm, I'm i'm really happy you did it it was a big part of why you know i decided to go ahead and and, and do this with you guys because i love small press releases uh i'm I'm, I'm an addict and I, I get as many as I can uh, from writers that I enjoy or from presses that I enjoy. But uh, as a writer, uh, it makes me, you know, I don't want to to limit the availability too much of what I do. I don't like the idea of of my own work being released in such small batches that it becomes collectible. You know, I'd rather, I'd rather it be, I'd rather take a more egalitarian approach and just mm. make things available to people who want them. And uh, so I was really happy that, uh, that not only that you're distributing it uh, over here uh, so easily, but also that uh, there's an ebook release as well. I personally can't read ebooks. I, I I find them they give me headaches. I don't like them, but I'm very happy they exist, and uh, and uh, I'm very I'm very pleased that you guys are doing ebooks too. As tablets and iPads and all of that becomes so much more prevalent, just the demand for ebooks does as well and for me personally now living in japan i mean i'm actually consuming most of my books via e-readers just via a standard kindle mm -hmm. um because obviously i couldn't ship an entire book collection from the uk to japan right. but here right you know you can buy as many books as you want and it's going to keep storing them and it's just a way for me to travel lightly and then still keep up to date with everything and there's so many good reasons for them that's one of them i know uh, people with with uh, failing vision it's easier to read the uh 
you can adjust the, the you know the font size. There are all kinds of good mm. reasons for it. And uh, whenever someone announces you know a, a upcoming book on social media, someone always asks, "Will there be an ebook?" And when the answer is no, you know the disappointment is is uh, is palpable. And and I'm sure on the writer's end as well, because why would you want to limit yourself? Why would you want to limit the reach of the of the story? So yeah, I'm I'm fully in favor of their of their continuation. Yeah, and I, I, I think really there are numerous ways in which people enjoy to consume stories, so why not put it out and cater to as many of those needs? I mean, another way, of course, is via audio, and so that's what we've been doing a, as a section of the podcast, now releasing these individual, uh, often narrated fiction episodes. And, and mainly... To be honest, that's because I'm a huge fan of audio, particularly when it's narrated by the author, because I think the way in which the author can deliver a story sometimes just adds that other level, that other depth to it that you wouldn't get through reading it <clears throat> yourself. Absolutely. I heard this story once, it may be totally apocryphal, but uh, you know, Bob Dylan, when he's starting out, was advised just to be a strong writer, not a song, not a singer of the songs, because of his voice. And uh, his contention was that no one's going to sing them the right way except for himself. You know that what you get, what you get with him singing his own songs overcomes whatever deficiencies his voice might have had. And I think that's true uh, with with uh, with writing as well. Yeah, I think with musicians, you hear all sorts of stories of. Uh, these artists being told that they shouldn't sing or <laughs> that wouldn't be, you know, advisable. I remember that Lemmy from Motorhead was told he couldn't sing and maybe he couldn't, but he's made a hell of a, a reputation <laughs> through not singing, as it were. <laughs> yeah, right. He's given it a damn good go, hasn't he? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's done okay for himself. Yeah. <laughs> so... Which authors intimidate you? Hmm. I don't know that I'm intimidated by other authors. Um, and I don't mean that in a way that it probably sounds. Um, I'm sure that sounds horribly arrogant, but that's not how I mean that. It's uh, I'm, I'm intrigued by them or I'm uh, excited by them. Usually the better the writing is, the more exciting that I find it. And it makes me want to try to do it too. Um, writers that I'm, in, that I'm intrigued by, I mentioned earlier, Helen Marshall and uh, Robert Shearman. I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by their stories because they're stories that would never occur to me to write in a million years. Uh, they're so strange and so, and so beautiful uh, that, that I'm just kind of, I find myself wanting to be the guy in the audience who raises his hand and says, where do you get your ideas? Uh, which you know never happens. Uh, but the writers that are exciting to me, the the, the prose and the structure of their stories uh, excite rather than intimidate. Are uh, like John Le Carre. Uh I'm amazed by how good he still is. You know, well into his 80s, I think. Um, I love the fact that the opening to almost all of his novels are a kind of a a set piece, almost like a showpiece. And uh, you can read the opening paragraphs to to most of his books, and just know that he's just, you know, this is this is like Wynton Marsalis doing a uh, doing Flight of the Bumblebee. It's just like coming onto the stage full bore. Uh, Lucia Shepard is the same way. I, I read Lucia Shepard, and the and, and the music in his prose is, uh, and 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 the the reality, the way he engages with with the senior side of real life is uh, is deeply inspiring to me. Whenever I find myself getting uh, tired or getting worn out or getting uh, discouraged at my own work or my own ability to do the work. Uh, I can go back to Lucia Shepard and read him and, and feel uh, like I'm plugged into a wall again, feel reinvigorated. Um, so I guess that's the best way I can answer that question. Uh, it's uh, I've never felt intimidated by other writers because I'd feel like the, you know, the, the range of possibilities is just too vast. And if there are writers who are doing things that are beyond my ability, and God knows there are many of them, it's not uh, a disincentive to me. It doesn't make me want to stop. It just makes me want to push further, you know, push further in my own direction or just try harder to do better. 
uh, I'm satisfied enough with my own level of ability that, uh, you know, that I'm okay with not being, you know, William Faulkner. I'm okay with not being, uh, you know, Jeff Vandermeer. And I'm, I'm okay doing what I do. And, uh, and if that, I mean, however that works out is fine. You know, if that makes me a small press guy my whole life, I like the small press. I love it. So that's fine by me too. Well, it seems to be working out pretty well so far. And of course you picked up the Shirley Jackson Award for the Monsters of Heaven. Yeah, that was nice. That was uh, that was definitely satisfying. It's uh, it's one of those things that were satisfying for about two or three hours, and then it becomes uh, something that happened in the past, and now you've got to do it again, or or get to the point where you feel like you're worthy of something like that again, some worthy of attention again. It's a it's, it's fun, but that... it's a small spike. I'm sorry. A reward something that matters to you, Nathan. Sorry to to jump in there. Um, not really, no. I mean, I, I, I'm not going to be completely disingenuous and say that uh, they, they mean nothing because, because you know, it, they do satisfy the ego. And, and, uh, and it, is, it is exciting to, uh, to get them. And uh, it's disappointing when you don't. But you have to kind of also keep them in, uh, in their own context. You know, every award has its own proponents, its own little, you know, kind of cosmos. And so there are political considerations, there are popularity considerations, and there are also just taste considerations. And you just can't – you can't take it personally when you're not nominated or when you don't win. And you certainly can't take it personally when, when, when you're lucky enough to win because it's ephemeral. You know, it's, a, it's, just, it's just the opinion of the moment. And, uh, and sometimes that isn't worth a whole lot. Um, but it does feel good, and it's and sometimes it's also the little impetus you need to to think that this is worth continuing to do. Um, there are times I'm sure I'm not alone in this as a writer, but there are, there are many times where I just think that I should just stop. You know, it's not worth it. Uh, the aggravation is too much. Uh, the return is too small. But um, but I don't actually believe that. I believe that it is worth it. I believe the return is good enough most days. And and when you know when when an award nomination comes, that can't help but be gratifying in a very in a very uh, you know ego boosting sort of way. You just have to keep it in context. If one of your stories was to be commissioned for film or television, which would you most like it to be, and why? Um. I guess I've always thought that Sunbleached is the one that lends itself to it most, most easily. It seems like it's, you know, I seem, I, I, I think that's a easily translatable, you know, setting. It's a, it's a small setting. I think it's a, it could be, it can be, uh, I think the idea is pretty good. You know, a vampire hiding into the crawl space under a house. I think that can be, that can be pretty scary. Um, it just seems modest enough and, and, and potent enough to, in order to make that transition. And it has a kind of the resolution I think that would be, you presume you know, provided they even kept the resolution. But it would, it, would, it has the kind of res resolution that feels like a proper ending. Some of my stories I know are a little bit more open ended, and uh, and this one is not. This one's got a very definite conclusion. So I think that would be the best one. But who's to say? Is there an actor that you would cast as Joshua? <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I never think about that kind of stuff. I don't no. know. <laughs> we were speaking to Josh Malaman yesterday for a, yeah. a future This Is Horror podcast interview, and I think we pretty much crafted out exactly what his vision of Bird Box would be if that were <laughs> translated oh, really? to screen. <laughs> yeah, we were coming up with all sorts. It was... <laughs> Quite an interesting That'd be a challenging one. one to to put on screen, I think, because so much of it happens with the protagonist is blindfolded, uh, and from her point of view. So that would be that would be an interesting transition. Yeah, I'd like to see I, it yeah. I mean, so we've got that interview coming up, but oh yeah, J Josh had some some pretty interesting ideas. I w I won't say anything for <laughs> fear of spoiling it. 
<laughs> well, we we sat down last night after after I recorded the podcast. We sat down after we eaten and we're like, right, let's watch a film tonight. And Jim was like, what do you want to watch? And I was like, Bird Box. It needs to be made like right now after that discussion. I, was like, I don't want to watch anything else. I want to watch Bird Box right now. Very disappointing. <laughs> no, good. I'll, I'll be sure to listen to that one then. I'll be, I'm interested to hear what he has to say. Yeah. Oh, it, it, it's going to be a multi-parter for sure. We were talking for a very Jeez. long time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we really were. Yeah. <laughs> So, what books or films do you most give as a gift to people? Or if you don't, which ones would you choose to gift people? <laughs> well, I don't usually give films, um, but I do give books a lot. I, I, I've i given Marie McHugh's Mothers and Other Monsters, a short story collection, uh, frequently. That's one of my favorite short story collections you know, of all time. I love that one to death. Um, let's see, I've been known to give uh, Arthur Mackin uh, his collection of short stories Tales of the Supernatural um, I just actually the uh, I just uh, what was the one I just sent out um, oh, uh, Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell to uh, someone who's looking for a uh, a big you know a big well-written fantasy that they can kind of lose themselves into for a long time but usually it's a uh, – I think Maureen's the one I've given out most often. Uh, Maureen McHugh is somebody I've kind of evangelized for in my own personal circle of friends. Okay, and finally, just to wrap up, for those who are relatively new into their writing career, could you give them one – piece of advice in terms of what to do and one piece of advice in terms of what not to do yeah um what to do is uh aside from the obvious which is just sitting down and doing the work which um which is uh surprisingly not obvious to a lot of writers is uh, is read voraciously, read voraciously, and read widely. I think a lot of people get caught in the trap of uh, of reading their own genre or even their own friends uh, almost exclusively, and I think that bankrupts bankrupts the imagination pretty quickly. And I would definitely advise not to do that. Um, read things that are outside your comfort zone. Uh, read books by other cultures, by other uh, you know. Read books if you're a man. Read them. Read, read books by women. Uh, just expand your 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 breadth of knowledge, your breadth of empathy and awareness as much as you possibly can. That can only help what you do. And uh, the what not to do, man. I've heard so many, so many prescriptions um, about what not to do, and I think I think what not to do is listen to too many rules about writing. You know, I think. Uh, I, I, I just really kind of bristle when people start talking about what you have to do uh, with writing. Even, you know, what I just said, although I believe it implicitly, uh, you know, it's it's a rule. And I think writing is not something that needs to be caged. Um, read, know your grammar, and, uh, and, and beyond that, don't listen to too many people telling you what not to do. Sounds good. Yeah, I I can almost imagine, well, a couple of things. I mean, firstly, if you were to take on board every single piece of writing advice you heard, you would never write because it would, co you know, it would contradict itself. So <laughs> you'd almost have this paralysis. And, yeah, and writers can't help but advise people to do what works for them. Mm. And... That's a very particular and very narrow uh, frame of reference. You know, Elmore Leonard is a writer almost, I mean, who, he's a, he's a terrific writer. Uh, but his rules of writing, you know, I think are, are, should be balled up and thrown in the garbage. You know, whenever I see that, his little list linked, it drives me crazy because I disagree with almost everything on there. Um, and yet, his books are terrific fun. So I think yeah, I, writers are going to talk about what works for them. 
if you if you can if you can glean something from it for yourself that's great but you must always keep in mind that this is a, this is a subjective list subjective to the writer who's saying it and i do think a lot of writing advice either explicitly or implicitly does come with that caveat you know that this is advice this is a way you could do it it's not a bible it's not a set of prescriptive rules that you absolutely have to follow and i think that's the way to glean uh the most and to use these writing these non-fiction books on writing most effectively take what you want leave what you don't want yeah i agree if they don't come with that caveat they certainly should yeah <laughs> and i think if you approach them, approach them that way then you're going to be fine yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, have you got any final thoughts or anything you'd like to, well, I'm going to say promote, apart from, obviously, the visible filth. <laughs> I, think, I think people know about that. We've <laughs> made them aware. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. there's nothing else uh, immediate to promote. Um, you know, I, I hope people, if they haven't picked up the book, I hope they do, and I hope they enjoy it. Um. And there are a few uncollected short stories that are out in anthologies right now. There's uh, The Atlas of Hell, as you mentioned, is uh, in Fearful Symmetries, edited by Ellen Datlow. Uh, Skull Pocket is a Nightmare Carnival, also edited by Ellen Datlow. Um, there's a story called The Diabolist, which is out in a book called Monstrous Affections, which is edited by Kelly Link and Gavin J. Grant. Um, so if anyone's curious, I'd steer them in that direction. But other than that, The Visible Filth is the... Uh, is the is the new one and uh beyond, i don't know what's coming out beyond that just yet okay well it's been absolutely fantastic to speak with you and i think we've we've covered an awful lot of ground and i'm sure that we'll we'll be talking to you again particularly when whatever comes out after the visible filth comes <laughs> out i mean there's so much more we could talk about uh but thank you for for spending some time with us and just leaving us with all this advice and all this knowledge and insight into your work. I appreciate you giving me the chance. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, thanks very much, Nathan. We've really appreciated your time today. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you for listening to our interview with Nathan Ballingrude. Remember to keep listening after the outro music as we will be previewing the audio recording of The Visible Filth, which you can get when you pre-order The Visible Filth this weekend. Thank you for listening to the This Is Horror podcast. If you've enjoyed the show, please just take 30 seconds to go on over to iTunes, leave us a rating, and if you're feeling really generous, leave us a review. If you'd like to support the podcast and help us pay for the various associated costs, such as the hosting, then please do go to the This Is Horror shop and purchase one of our books. You can also shop through our affiliate links, which you'll find in the show notes. You'll be able to find the This Is Horror shop at thisishorror.co.uk and also at thisishorror.co.uk. In the right-hand navigation, you can sign up for our this is horror newsletter and keep up to date with everything thank you for listening have a great day the visible filth written and narrated by nathan ballingrude the roaches were in high spirits there were half a dozen of them caught in the teeth of love they capered across the liquor bottles perched atop poor spouts like wooden ladies in the prows of sailing ships they lifted their wings and delicately fluttered. They swung their antennae with a ripe sexual urgency, tracing love sonnets in the air. Will, the bartender on duty, stood watching them with his back to the rest of the bar. He couldn't move. He was bound by a sense of obligation to remain where he was, but the roaches stirred a primordial revulsion in him, and the urge to flee was palpable. His flesh shivered in one convulsive movement. He worked the 6 p.m. to 2 a.m. shift at Rosie's Bar, a little hole in the wall tucked back in the maze of streets of uptown New Orleans, Surrounded by shotgun houses settling into their final repose, their porches bedazzled in old Mardi Gras beads and sprung couches. The bar's interior reflected its environment. 
a few tables and chairs against the back wall, a jukebox, ranks of stools against the bar. He often had the misfortune of minding the place when the roaches started feeling passionate. It happened a few times a year, and each time it paralyzed him with horror. At the moment, his only customers were Alicia, a 28-year-old server at an oyster bar in the French Quarter, a longtime regular and his best friend, and Jeffrey, her boyfriend of the moment, soon to be hustled into the ranks of the exes if Will knew her at all. Jeffrey was one of those pretty boys with the hair and the lashes she liked, but he was not on her wavelength at all. Will gave him another month, tops. This place is disgusting, Alicia said, watching the show from a somewhat safer distance. Don't slam the bar, babe, said Jeffrey. It's just bugs. Fucking gross bugs who want to get busy on my bottle of Jameson. Will just nodded. It was indeed disgusting. You should get an exterminator, brother, said Jeffrey. Seriously. The same conversation every time. Just different faces. Yep. Talk to the boss. You know they say when you see one, there's thousands more in the walls. Oh yeah? Is that what they say? Alicia said, shut up, Jeffrey. Make me. She pulled his face to hers and kissed him deeply. Apparently love was in the air at Rosie's bar that night. Jeffrey cupped the back of her head with one hand and let the other go sliding up her leg. He was a good boy. He knew what to do. Will waited for the roach to relinquish its claim to the Jameson, then poured himself a shot. People from Louisiana like to call the cockroach the official state bird. They're practically everywhere, and you couldn't worry too much if you saw one. No matter how clean you kept your place, they were going to get in. But when you got something like this, you were infested. There must be a huge nest somewhere in the wall or underneath the building. Maybe more than one. He didn't think an exterminator would fix this problem. The whole wall needed to be torn out. Maybe the whole building would have to be burned to the dark earth, and then you'd have to keep on burning, all the way down to their mother nests in hell. The roaches made little ticking noises as they scrambled about, and he had the brief, uncanny certainty that the noises would cohere into a kind of language if he listened carefully enough. After a few more minutes, the bugs retired to their bedrooms, and the rows of bottles resumed their stately, lighted beauty. Jeffrey had his hand in Alicia's shirt. That shirt comes off, and it's free drinks all night, Will said. Jeffrey pulled away, his face flushed. Alicia smoothed her shirt and her hair. You wish, child. I really do. Alicia circled her finger over the bar. Shots. Line them up. Maybe you'll see something before the night is through. He doubted it, but he poured them anyway. Like most 24-hour bars in New Orleans, the place did a decent business, even on off nights. Most of the late-night clientele was made up of service industry drones like Alicia and Jeffrey, or cab drivers, or prostitutes, or just the lonely losers of the world, sliding their rent dollar by dollar into the video poker machines lined up like totems against the back wall. A few college kids filed in, finding a table some distance from the bar. After a moment, one of them broke away and approached Will with an order for them at the table. Will cast his eye across the bunch, three girls and two guys, including the one place in the order. Almost certainly, some of them were underage. College kids usually hit the quarter for fun, but the Loyola campus was just a few blocks away, so inevitably, a few of them drifted into Rosie's throughout the week, looking for a quiet night. Everybody 21? Will said. The kid showed him his ID, sighing with the patience of a beleaguered saint. Legal, less than a month. What about everybody else? Yeah, man. You want me to go get him? A weak bluff. Will thought about it. It was a Tuesday night, the shift was almost over, and the drawer was light. He decided he didn't care. Don't worry about it. Someone put some money into the jukebox, and Tom Waits filled the silence. The college kids huddled around the table once they got their drinks, their backs forming a wall against the world. They seemed to be fixated on something between them. They were a lot quieter than he thought they'd be, though, which he considered a blessing. The night continued along its smooth course until Eric and his buddies walked in, staining the mood. They'd obviously already been on the bar circuit that night, coming in with beers in hand, descending on the pool table. Eric lifted his chin to Will in greeting. His three friends didn't trouble themselves. Hey, Eric. You guys need anything? We're set for now, brother. Thanks. Eric was a little plug of muscle and charisma. He was the sweetest guy in the world when sober. When he was drunk, though, every human interaction became a potential flashpoint for violence. He lived in an apartment above the bar, so Will got to see that side of him a lot. How's Carrie? Alicia asked, drawing him back. Will shrugged, feeling a surge of unanchored guilt. She's fine, I guess. Head in the computer all the time, working on that paper she's doing for school. Same as always. You got yourself a smart one. 
Jeffrey perked up, caught in a wash of inspiration. Hey, we should all go out sometime. Does she like football? We could go to a Saints game. The idea almost made him laugh. No, man, she doesn't like football. Alicia touched his hand. That's totally a good idea, though. Let's just hang out. I haven't seen her in weeks. We could double date. Oh, my God. Don't be a dick, Will. Make it happen. I'll suggest it to her. I'm telling you, though, she's living her schoolwork right now. I'm not even sure she remembers my name. Make it happen. A bottle shattered somewhere by the pool table, followed by a muffled grunt. The bar went silent except for the sound of scuffling shoes and short bursts of breath, overlaid with a jaunty dirge from the violent femmes. Eric and one of the guys he'd come in with were grappled together, Eric's arm around the other guy's neck. He hit him in the face with three quick shots. The guy gripped the jagged neck of his beer bottle and swung it around to rake it across Eric's arm. Blood splashed to the grungy linoleum. God damn it, Will said. Somebody get that fucking bottle. Nobody wanted to get near them. One of the other guys Eric had come in with, some heavily muscled punk with his hat on backwards and some kind of Celtic tattoo snaking down his right arm, leaned against the pool table and laughed. God damn, son, he said. Fights happened all the time, and sometimes you just had to let them play themselves out, but the jagged bottle elevated this to a higher level of calamity. Eric wouldn't let go of the guy's neck. He hit him again a few more times, and when the bottle came around once more, he took it on the cheek. Blood sprayed onto the floor, the pool table, across his own face. Eric made a high-pitched noise that seemed to signal a transition into another state of being. That seemed to carve this moment from the rational world and hold it separate. It seemed that another presence had entered the room, something invisible, some blood-streaked thing crawling into the light. Jeffrey flew in from the sideline like some berserker canary in a sky full of hawks. He threw himself against them both, wrapping his weak little hands around the wrist of the guy with a broken bottle. The momentum of his charge carried them all into the table where the college kids were sitting, and everybody went down in a clamor of toppling chairs and spilling glasses and shrieks of fear. Alicia shouted something, running toward the tumble of bodies. Will rounded the bar. Too late, he knew. He should have been the one to engage them, and followed her into the scrum. A bright flash leapt from the tangle of bodies like lightning in the belly of a thunderhead. By the time he arrived, it was already over. Eric had maneuvered on top of the other guy and was giving him a brutal series of jabs to the side of the head before somebody finally pulled him off. His antagonist, deprived of his weapon, moved groggily, his eyes already swelling shut, his face a bloodied wreck. His right hand looked broken. The kids who'd been at the table formed a penumbra around the scene, looking on with an almost professional calm. One of the girls said, Did you call the police? Of course I fucking did. She looked at the others and said, Let's go. They dispersed immediately, pouring through the door and sublimating into the night. Once freed from the actual entanglement, Eric had grown immediately calm, like a chemical rendered inert. The flesh on his cheek was torn in gruesome display. He would leave a scar that would pull his whole face out of alignment. He seemed not to feel it. His eyes were dilated and unfocused, but the rage seemed spent, and he went back to the pool table to retrieve what was left of his beer. Eric, Will said, you need to get to a hospital, seriously. Cops are coming, he said. The words were a slush in his mouth. Yes. Fucking pussy. Will didn't know if that was meant for him or for the guy on the floor. All right, come on, Eric said, and headed out the door. His remaining friends followed, not sparing a glance for their vanquished comrade.